Come with us on a journey into the unknown, the unexplained, and the unbelievable. We will test your senses and challenge your beliefs. A world where science and religion clash. Or do they? You will meet real people and hear real stories, but you will not believe. You will witness strange sights and hear strange sounds, but you will not believe. This is the New England Ghost Project. Welcome to the Nightmare. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ghost Chronicles Next Generation. I am Ron Kolick, your host. And with me all the way from the chair next door <laughs> is the blonde bombshell herself, and Kerrigan. And good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Why, where were they? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome <laughs> <her> back. <laughs> all right, welcome back to us. You know, I swear there's a full moon today. I mean, not the one behind uh, us either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, see the full moon with the cross behind us? Well, that is actually a photograph taken by uh, Nick Mantello. So I want to give him credit for that. And I, I asked him do. if we could use that for uh, Spirit Quest. Mm -hmm. Angels and Demons this year, and yes. he said absolutely, so it's on all our uh, literature and everything. That is so very cool. cool. Yep. Very cool, very cool So anyways, Angels and Demons uh, for the, in Spirit Quest, for those who don't know about Spirit Quest, Spirit Quest is a, um, I, I don't know what to call it. I hate calling it a conference because I think it's so much more than that. It's mm -hmm. an experience. It's an experience. Uh, and Definitely. we've been doing it for <laughs> several years now. Uh, last year was ghost hunting and witchcraft, witchcraft. right? Yes. The year before that was yep. ghost hunting and spir spiritual spiritualism. Mm -hmm. So this year is uh, Angels and Demons. Yes. Can't Torn wait. from the pages of Dan Brown's book. <laughs> which and that was read. a good book. Yeah, you Very, read that, both right? those, Yeah, I've been the first one with the Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code uh, and then Angels and Demons. Angels and Demons. I actually watched the Angels and Demons last night. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was good. I liked it. Uh, I liked it a lot. And later on in the show, we're going to have uh, uh, Nathan, what's his name? May May Mayor. Mayor. Mayor on. In Our the, paranormal news guy. News guy, right. <laughs> and we're going to discuss the movie a little bit and some yes, other stuff too. Definitely. Whether he wants to or not. And one of, <laughs> one of the things that I really love about those books and those movies um, is all the symbolism uh, that mm -hmm. they use and, and how they derive the clues. Funny you mention that, because as part of Spirit Quest, uh, if you're part of the, the weekend thing, you get your first clue and mm -hmm. you become a symbologist and you follow clues all through the weekend to find the lost relic. Oh, that's awesome. You I ask hope what I a relic is, but we'll talk about that later I have on. a huge book of uh, of all uh, symbol, all different kinds of symbolism. Really? Yeah, I love that. Just love it. Oh, my, cool. One of so my it's going to be part things. of uh, Spirit Quest this Excellent. year. Excellent. So Can't cool. wait. And once again, the uh, the title is Angels and Demons. Yes. And we're going to discuss uh, a lot there. We're going to talk a little bit about it. But I'm going to have to turn to my angel. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> Okay, so I was okay. going to turn to my angel, the blind bombshell. That's shell, what I should have done. And, and okay. she's going to discuss funny. angels. <laughs> wow. Well, that wasn't what I was expecting. I'm sorry. It just came out. It just happened. It did. I'm sorry. So we've talked so many times about angels and demons, I think, on this show, and uh, it plays into uh, a little bit of everything. I mean, in the paranormal, I, you just can't avoid it. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that I particularly enjoy, uh, and we all know that I'm into the cemeteries, and I really love finding well, angels. In the cemeteries. Well, not in. Yeah, anyways, like six, eventually Not maybe. six feet under, but I enjoy my cemetery mm -hmm. time. When I can find an angel, I just love, love, love photographing them. So I thought, and I will be speaking also at uh, Spirit Quest. Spirit Quest about angels in the cemetery, of course. When I was in the course of looking through all my photos and trying to think about, well, what am I going to show? I started doing more research into angelology. And I know there's very many is people that a word? out there. It is a, it is a word, mm -hmm. angelology. Mm -hmm. Just like demonology, you have oh, angelology. Right. So 
I guess angelology is probably a little bit more fun. Right. Ronology. <laughs> Ronology. That's a scary topic. That's a good one. I like that. So I ran across in my research angel hierarchy. And I never was aware that this existed. So I just thought I would touch upon this a little bit because this will be part of my presentation at Spirit Quest. So the whole angel hierarchy came about in the uh, 4th or 5th century because people were basically worshiping angels instead of God. and Because the they liked angels. Uh, church were... They we were have our getting, own angels, speaking about we angels. Do. We do. Yes, we but, do. Uh, yeah. So they were getting upset. Uh, the church was getting upset about this, that that was idolatry, and mm -hmm. you're supposed to just be worshiping God. On so, a side note. Yes. Do you know that's the difference, one of the differences between Orthodox religions and like Catholic religion because mm -hmm. we have uh, statues. Right. And they believe that that's uh, worshiping false gods because right. it's idolization or whatever you call it. So they have pictures instead, icons and so forth. Ah, so, I see. But that's why they don't have statues and we do. So. Oh, thank you. I did not know that. That's what this show is all about, learning, so, <laughs> learning ronology. Ronology. So the person that established this angel hierarchy was called, and pardon me if I massacre this name, Pseudo He's dead. Who cares? Dionysius the Areopagite. Seriously. Ooh, that is a mouthful. So just to run through, there are three spheres of angels. So the, what are spheres like? The first, it's like a level. Oh, okay. It's like a, a, a group. All right. Okay. Just so couldn't the, say the, level, we have to call them the, spheres. The, the, the okay. first sphere of Fine, angels, whatever. and the highest angel, angels are the seraphim. And Russ, I believe I have a picture of the seraphim in there if you can find it. And this is the highest angelic class. They are the I caretakers. The were the highest. Nope. Shh. Quiet. Oh. You have to listen. Fine. So Whatever. this is the highest angelic class. They serve as the caretakers of God's throne. They are fiery six-winged wings, be six -winged beings. Two wings cover their faces. Two wings cover their feet. And the last two are used to fly. Okay, thanks, Russ, and that's, that's what you're seeing on the screen now, mm -hmm. is a depiction, a carving of that angel. So the next one uh, in the first sphere are the cherubim. Oop, you can go ahead to that next cherubim. Go ahead, Russ, I think you had that. And this is kind of a squishy picture, and I apologize. It's, it, the computer does this to us. The cherubim has four faces. Comprised what? of a man, an ox, a lion, and an eagle. Four co-joined wings covered with eyes. A lion's body figure and ox's feet. They guard the way to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden and the throne of God. They are often confused with putty or putty. I'm not sure how I say putty. that. Which are the baby-like angels. Oh. When you think of cherubs, uh, that's what you think of. Well, Ready? the cherubim are so not those little <laughs> cherubs. No. They are basically, they are the guardians. Okay. And you can take that down now, Russ, the uh, photo. So the cherubim are really, you know, bad. Uh, I, bad. Good. Bad. They're good, but they're, they're, they're yeah, the guardians. Bad, they're, they're like warrior kind of people. Yeah. And interestingly enough, these four faces that they have yeah. are also used. You'll see them in the cemetery. They became Hopefully actually not. the symbols of the saints, the man, the ox, a lion, and an eagle. And Russ, I do have one for the saints in there, if you can put that picture up. Um, Whoa. That one is too squishy. There's the next one. Can we go to the next? Um, that is a giant Celtic cross, by the way. Here we go. That's better. That's a clearer picture. And on this, I found this in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, one of my favorite cemeteries. And you will see the, the man, the ox, the lion, and the eagle. And those are all symbolic of the, the saints. Um, so is that a winged lion? Uh, yes. 
It so is that a would winged be a griffin. lion. It, it does look like a griffin. Hmm, interesting. So thanks, Russ. That's awesome on that picture. The saints ended up with the uh, symbols of the cherubim. So we can take that down now, Russ. So the next level in this first sphere are the thrones. They are living symbols. I don't have a picture for this. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Living symbols of God's justice and authority. Some say they're symbolized by a wheel within a wheel with hundreds of eyes. Other descriptions include uh, them being elder men who listen to the will of God and present the prayers of men. So that's your top sphere of angels. Mm -hmm. The second sphere of angels and I do not have pictures for any of these because I could not find any. Uh, the first level uh, is dominions or lordships, which they regulate the duties of the lower angels. And they are, it's very rare for them to be physically known to humans. The second level in this sphere are the virtues or strongholds. Now the virtues you will see very, very, often in cemeteries and they're the ministries through which signs and miracles are made in the world there are seven virtues faith hope charity temperance prudence fortitude and justice and ron said to me earlier well i never knew that these were actual these were angels i always right. thought these were uh Just virtues like virtues right. things traits. your your traits or your morals yeah. but they're actually a tier of angels. Hmm. So let's start with faith. And Russ, if you could put up the picture I have of faith. It starts with virtue, faith. And she is depicted as a woman. She's again a little squishy in this photo with a cross, chalice, or candle. And she can be seen at a baptismal font or holding an oil burning lamp. And in this particular picture, Faith is holding a cross and a chalice. And there are many faiths <laughs> in the cemetery. The next one, and I see hope everywhere. If you see an angel in the cemetery, nine times out of 10, it's going to be hope. If we can find one for hope, Russ, uh, she is seen as an angel with wings, but she's also seen with an anchor and that is her symbol of hope i tend not to see hope with wings in the cemetery but i always see her with an anchor and russ i think i have a couple of different hopes if you want to put so another what's one symbolism up symbolism of the anchor anchor is the symbol of hope oh. i don't know why okay i'm sorry curious. <laughs> Well, you were the symbologist. I, I know. Really know um, I would think an anchor would steady you and keep you from drifting away, and that would be your hope. That would be my interpretation of that. Okay. So the next virtue is charity, and she is usually seen in the process of revealing one breast. Excuse me? Which gives nod to her depiction in the art world as nursing an infant. Um... She is also tending to be seen with a flame, a torch, or a candle. And in this picture that I'm showing right now, although this woman is fully clothed on the top, Thank she God. is holding a torch, which is facing downward and is being extinguished. Uh, the next virtue is temperance. And she can be seen adorning the tombs of prohibitionists or those who do not drink, often known as teetotalers. And she's usually carrying some type of water pitcher. She may also carry a torch, a bridle, and a bit, which symbolizes control, or a sheathed sword, which represents restraint. Mm. The next virtue is prudence. Must be the painter saying a woman. Uh -huh. Prudence is in not only our angel is named Prudence here. She is not usually seen in the cemetery setting, but when she is included, she may be holding up a mirror with a snake nearby. Ooh. In the art setting, she is se uh, seen with two heads and often a snake or a dragon. And in this picture, you can see her holding the mirror, but the snake is actually at her feet, so you can't really see it. Mm. 
She, uh, these things are used to symbolize the wisdom of the quest for self-knowledge. Uh, and I have a message from the chat, anchor and hope. Sailors connected the symbol of the anchor, aha, as stability and strength. By putting down the anchor of a ship, it represented the hope for a safe journey. Thank oh, you. Cool. Thank you, my, uh, my chat room. Who sent that to us? Or Sam. Sam got that for me. Thank you, our, mm. our, our teleprompter girl. Thank you so awesome. much. All right, we're going to move on to the next virtue, which is fortitude. She's a female warrior often standing with a hand on her hip in a confident stance. She may carry a large stick, club, or sword at her side and can also be seen with a column at her side. And there's fortitude on the screen now. And there's another one. Why are they all women? Um, must have something to do with their strength. Yeah, right. I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Russ, can you put up the other fortitude? That's what I was thinking. Thank you. This is a very famous angel. She's in Lakeview Cemetery in uh, Cleveland. And she is made by Hasserot, that was the sculptor. This is one of my all-time favorite sculptures. And as you can see, she has that sword. Mm -hmm. And the last virtue is justice. She's one of the easier virtues to identify as she's always shown holding scales. However, you will seldom see her in a cemetery. In this particular justice, I took this photograph at the Forefathers Monument in Plymouth, Mass. If you ever get a chance to go see this, uh, this is one of many, many carvings on that monument. It's fabulous. It's kind of, it's big like the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Not quite that high, but was made by the same sculptor. Awesome. Okay, so just to wrap up my angels, uh, thanks Russ, you can take that down. So the third level of the second sphere are powers or authorities, and they are warrior angels that oppose evil spirits. Uh, it's theorized that Satan was the chief of the powers before he fell, and their duty is to oversee the distribution of power among humankind. The third and final sphere mm -hmm. are the principalities or rulers. They're angels that guard and protect nations or groups of people or the church. Then the archangels. Okay. The archangels are down. down at the bottom, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. They're messengers, as all angels are messengers, but they are also protectors. And we all know Archangel Michael uh, was the one who took Satan down, thrown out of, out of uh, heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's a picture of Michael with Satan, defeating Satan up on the screen there now. Mm -hmm. So, and then we are now down at the, almost the bottom, angels, just plain old angels. They are sent as messengers to humanity. And the very bottom of the third sphere, which is what is closest to us, are personal guardian angels. And they're supposedly assigned to every human being. So all of us have our own little guardian angel. So that is my little presentation on angels. I will go much more in depth at Spirit Quest. I'm not a late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna roll this back over to Ron. We are? We actually have a question. Oh, we have a question. Have Ron and Anne ever felt energy that could be felt as angelic during any of their investigations or visits? Well, working with you, I've always felt angelic uh, energy. Uh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I, I honestly have not. Have you, um, as far as an angelic? The question is, <laughs> what does angelic energy feel like? Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell. Do you think you have protectors? Do you think that you are protected? I think so. Mm -hmm. And so we have that feeling. Are we talking that that is an angel, if you want to call it? Yeah. So I, I, I feel that way. I mean, how many times have things happen to you and you say, oh, the angels were looking after you. Oh, absolutely. Right? I know my husband has a guardian angel. Yeah? Ooh, yes. Oh, if he, he didn't, it. I don't think he'd still be upright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So that was interesting. We're gonna do a show on angels sometime, just angels. Oh, and, that would love the, that. That whole thing, that'd be kind of cool. That would be awesome. But uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. 
I forget where we're going now. Wait, wait. <laughs> well, we were going to move on from angels, mm -hmm. uh, staying kind of in that saintly realm, mm -hmm. talking about relics. Oh, really? Relics? From the church. Okay. And I know you had right. mentioned. Right. You know, we, we, we talk, and once again, Spirit Quest is all about the paranormal, but it's also this year is the relationship with religion. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I love doing, absolutely love, is psychometry. Mm -hmm. And that is basically holding an object and being able to read the energy or get an impression from that object. And when I first heard about this, I thought it was, uh, you know, a bunch of baloney. Like, how can you get impressions from an object like a stone or a key or something? But then I started to think about, because I'm a good old Catholic boy, the relics, mm -hmm. which are either pieces of the saints or, or possessions of the saints. So anyways, we're going to learn a little bit about relics here from one of the shows that we did, right? Yes. Yes. We had a show a few months back, which was very... Which is one of Anne's favorite shows, by the way. Memorable show to me. Yeah. If you saw it, you know why, but mm -hmm. we digress. Can we play uh, the first clip, Russ, please, which is relics. It explains relics. Yeah. Do you know what a relic is? I do not know what a relic is. Okay. What's a relic? So we're going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about relics. Uh, we're going to talk about relics. Okay. Uh, so, Russ, if you'll get my list of top relics per ready, uh, we will go to it, but don't start yet. Uh, so anyways, uh, the word relic is derived from the Latin word meaning re reliquous, meaning Guess what? Relinquish? Would you guess? What would you guess? Relinquish? Yeah. What do you think it would mean? Um, to give something up? Uh, close enough. Well, that would be the definition. Uh, it means left behind. Left behind. Yeah. Relinquish. Okay. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you give it, but you leave it behind. Mm -hmm. So anyways, the word is derived from reckless, which means left behind. Relics have always played an important part in religion, and not only Catholic religion, but many others. Mm -hmm. uh, more than decaying body parts uh, and stained rag or cloths, uh, these items became the physical embodiment of God's work on earth. Oh. Uh, many churches uh, during the Middle Ages, okay, this is interesting, uh, cashed in on the hype oh. and created their own religious relics. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> at one time, there was more than seven heads of John the ba Baptist. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so, I mean, there's, you know, this, you know, if it was a way to make money, then, they, you know, back at that time, especially in the medieval. Wow. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so there were different classes of relics. Okay. Okay, there are three classes. The first class relic is actually a pot of the saint. A pot? Yeah, a pot. A pot. A Excuse pot. Excuse our New England accent. Like a pot. bone, hair, Oh, blood. okay, a okay. pot. Okay. Which I actually have a first class relic in, in the blood of... Uh, St. Chabelle, which we will talk about later. Uh, the second class relic is something that is owned by the saint or instrumental or an instruments of torture that we used against the martyr. Oh. Okay. So they have, they have torture devices? Yeah, so yeah, nice. these can become relics. Uh. <laughs> and the, this is the interesting one though, okay? Uh -huh. A third class relic. A third class, class relic is j consists of something that has touched a first or second class relic. Anyone can make their own third-class relic by touching an object against the first and second-class oh, relic. Oh God! <laughs> so if you got a third-class, this class, is pretty complicated. So if you got a third-class relic, it's like, eh, whatever. Uh, ah, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, there you go. I mean, that tells us a little <laughs> bit about relics. But you can see, I mean, the, the interesting thing when we started doing this, and and you were doing your research, and I was doing my research, we realized the complications, not the the complexity, complexity, right. complexity of uh, the Catholic religion, as, as well as other religions, how deep it is and everything. And like in the book, uh, Dan Brown's book, Angels and Demons, I mean, you looked at that, you saw different aspects that we didn't know about. Right. And one of the things that we will be doing at Spirit Quest is, is a conclave, which is how they elect popes, except we'll be doing it uh, for a best dress costume, ah, mm, best in show, as I like to say. So we're actually at the ceremony. The yeah, we could do all that <laughs> stuff. Smoking something, that's for sure. Uh, another thing I will be doing at Spirit Quest is the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of that? Yes, I yeah. actually have. Yeah. 
have and uh, I think we have a picture of that. Uh, there, there you go. go. There it is, Shroud of Turin. And I have a, a the original shroud is 14 feet long. Right. By three and a half. Mm -hmm. I have one half of it, a wow. replica of one half of it, mm -hmm. which is the front half. It has the front half and the back half. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be doing a whole talk about that. And, and it's really interesting because, once again, it's very complicated and very mysterious, just like the Catholic religion and everything else. And, you know, you, you have certain theories and you have certain proofs, but they all can be looked at different ways. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to, to do another Shroud of Turing. Shroud of Turing, for those who don't know, it's supposed to have been the burial cloth of what? The Shroud of Turin, yes. the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. There you go. I know that. There you go. We can lose that picture now, Russ. Yep. So we'll be uh, we'll be talking about. I will be talking about the giving a presentation, and I will have the actual uh, replica of it there as well. That's pretty cool. Yep. So. Uh, all right. uh, and also uh, on our other show, we had a young lady by the name of Wendy Reardon, mm -hmm. who. Uh, it's a pole dancer, but other than that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was our highest viewership at show. <laughs> but anyways, she also uh, has a, a degree in papal funerals or whatever. Yeah. And she's going to do a lot about that, which is, once again, it's, it's so intriguing, all how they died and what's going on, the intrigue and everything. And she's going to have a papal death mass there as well. That was a that So was can a we play thing. that, that, that yeah. clip from that show? So tell us about the death mass. This is our good friend, Pope St. Pius IX, who died in the 19th century, late 19th century. And when he died, the Roman mob was furious with him because, um, <laughs> because Italy became united. So on his funeral procession from St. Peter over to the church, San Paolo Fiore La Mura, where he's buried, they tried to toss his body into the Tiber River. So the uh -huh. Roman mob doesn't do that anymore. It's no fun anymore. But uh. that is a death mass. I actually got off eBay. Oh my God. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so, Wendy, I have to ask you this, yes. uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, I did a show on relics. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love relics. Did. You remember that, Ann, don't you? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, very well. So, there are different Engraved classes. into my memory. Yeah. There are different classes of relics. Right. For instance, yes. the, the Pope's inners mm -hmm. would be a first-class relic. Right. And then, would this be a third or a second-class relic? This, oh, no. Uh, a papal death mask, no. I mean, if, if for the original. Well, well, if it's the original one. Oh, right? the original one. That would he just So the saint, original would be. would be a second class relic because it uh, was the Pope's, right? Wouldn't it be a first class because it actually touched, touched oh, yeah, him? Oh, yeah, touched it. Yeah, touched him. Yeah. All right, you're right. It would be first right. class. Well, a third class relic is something that touched the second class relic. So. So um, I'm trying to find out. I think that's a third class relic, is what I'm saying. Hmm. I didn't think of it that way. I guess you know if the original, if that comes, if that really comes from the original death mask, then somewhere along the line, that is a third class relic. I guess it would be. I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh. All right. I don't know. Good. So why do we have death masks? That what, was common. What what brought this about, and and why? It's not why just popes. Have it's not just popes. It's death, not just popes. No. Oh, does everyone's got a death mask? Everybody has death Everybody. Mask. Oh yeah. Well, my, have one. So, a big one, but a, uh, mm. my grandmother died in our house, and we had plaster of Paris. Did I make a death mask? No. Did I cut hair for jewelry? No. You got to remember, back in Victorian times, and, yeah. and they they would this is very common. They would they, they made jewelry mask. out of people. The hair jewelry. The hair stuff? jewelry. Well, hair I have, yes, yeah. The, yeah. The hair jewelry I've absolutely heard of. Uh, absolutely. So, um, but they but used I, to make masks. I've never heard of them making a mask of a dead person. I absolutely did. So the, there's famous the, people the, you can see their death mask. Poor people die and they just slap. Well, not poor. Slap. Well, like no, Abraham, no, think poor. Abraham Lincoln I mean, has one. They um, die. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln had one. Yeah. I never. There's, knew that. there's like uh, websites and uh, museums of death masks. Yeah. Absolutely. I Okay. okay. <laughs> so you see, even that's complicated with the relics, right? Oh, yes. Determining what class mm -hmm. they are. Right. And I found out why you guys laughed, too, because someone from the chat room asked if I was a relic because I was 100 years old. So it, it, it's not how you become a relic, <laughs> by the way. If you were listening to my thing, that's not a relic. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. All right. So, but... There are ways you can become a relic, and one of the, the ways is stigmata. 
Stigmata, yes. Stigmata, stigmata. Stigmata, stigmata. Stigmata. <laughs> Just wicked funny. But no, <laughs> right, so stigmata, right, is what? Well. I mean, there are many saints that are, that took on this stigmata traits and they became saints. Right. Yeah. Now, well, I think the person who can best explain what a stigmatist is. Sam? Is Mother Angelica. Oh, okay. We have a clip of Mother Angelica explaining what a stigmatic is. And if we could roll that, please, that will give us a good explanation. I know some of you are just saying, what in the world are we talking about? Well, there are many people in the world. I've often thought that there are many people throughout the, throughout the centuries, uh, every century has had its stigmatism. The first that we know of for sure was St. Francis of Assisi. And there have been many, you know, Teresa Neumann, and, and there have been uh, uh, Padre Pio, and even Catholic, the great Saint Catherine of Siena, who had the stigma. And that means that they suffer the very wounds and the very pain that Jesus suffered, not in the same way, because they're finite creatures. But the purpose of this is to make reparation for all the sins in the world, and a constant reminder to us of the, the action of God upon the soul and to make reparation for all the sins, the many, 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 many sins in the world. And so many of them suffer flagellation. I mean, they, on their body appears these terrible wounds of Jesus. Some had the crown of thorns. A woman I knew, Mrs. Wise, had that, and the stigmata. And, and they bleed every Friday on the anniversary of our Lord's uh, death and crucifixion. And I know it's a mystery. Suffer from 5 in the morning till 12. The, she would suffer the passion. She was in pain, something in agony. And that started uh, that way. Then she went into uh, every week. It, uh, every Thursday night, around midnight, she'd start, her wounds would start to open. And she would bleed and bleed. And uh, the, 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 the son, uh, the, uh, Bill, the brother of Rose, the younger brother, uh, would uh, describes it. And he said his mother would uh, have to put big uh, towels because it would squirt on the, the blood would ooze on the walls and everywhere. And then she uh, the feet, the hands, the crown of thorns, three quarters of an inch of blood under her eyes. And she represents- That's all during the Passion. The Passion, and she represented the holy face of our Lord. My, uh, Bill says, I was so surprised once to come in to see my sister, and to see it was not my sister anymore, it was Jesus. Okay, so that was uh, a little bit about stigmata stuff, right? Yes. Right. Which and is really kind of fascinating. It's uh, something really paranormal, I think. Right. Um, I mean, if she, stigmatics are paying for sins, I mean, God, you must have somebody working all the time. I huh? have, yeah, I guess yeah. so. But uh, we had actually had a question uh, in the chat room about relics, so before we move on. Before we move on, uh, the question is, do we think that the belief of others creates the power of a relic? Or is it the relic itself containing a shard of religious power from a divine source? Well, that's an interesting question because um, I believe that's from Stephen Scott, and and it's a theory uh, of where it comes from. But when when Stephen sometimes picks up on energy, he picks up what he calls residual energy. He's not speaking to a live person, a dead live person, uh, <laughs> but he's picking up on energy. So yeah, the energy is imprinted in the object. So. A relic is that has that same energy. It comes from whoever that person is. If that person has to be, if that per person happens to be in the divine realm, meaning, meaning they're close to a, a greater good or a greater God or, or whatever, then that same energy could come through in a relic, and it could have possess powers of healing or. Whatever, so it, you know, I, I believe, that's what I believe anyways, and now I tell you that's absolutely the, the truth. No, I mean, that's my own it's personal belief. Your opinion, your yeah. opinion, which kind of is a bit of psychometry. Right. right, and we actually went to a grave of one of the stigmatists, right? Yes, we did. 
we went to Precious Blood Cemetery in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and learned about America's only stigmatic, mm -hmm. Rosemary Ferrone. So we're going to roll that clip. Is the grave of America's only stigmatic? A quick definition is one who bears the wounds of Jesus Christ. Marie Rose Ferron, also known as the Petite Rose. Although we arrived late in the afternoon at the cemetery, I was able to shoot this quick video at her very humble grave. I'm here in Precious Blood Cemetery in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And we're standing at the grave of Rose Ferron, also known as La Petite Rose. And Rose was the United States only stigmatic. She is buried here in Precious Blood Cemetery and uh, she died at age 34, very young. It was said that for the last 10 years of her life, she bore the wounds of Jesus from the crown of thorns, hands, and other marks. And when she died at 34, became very famous. Uh, they used to allow you to leave offerings at the grave, can no longer do that. She also has a large uh, tomb erected to her in Chicago. But for right now, this is her very humble and simple tomb here at Precious Blood. Well, that was pretty cool. Yes. So anyways, uh, speaking about this, who is this? Rosemary Ferron. Yes. We actually have on the set now someone who we does our, normally does our news, but is now going to join us on the set. And he is uh, Nathan Mayer. So can we have a three shot, please? Thank you very there much. There is. There Yay. you go. So Welcome, while, Nate. while this was rolling, you actually had a story for us, right? About somebody. Yeah, my friend Amy on her father's side, um, her lineage is connected to Rosemary Farron. That's really? amazing. Yeah. Wow. So Does she like glow in the dark or anything? No, but she did. I forget the name of the title, but in high school she received some. Uh, my friend Amy received some honorary title from our church. So oh, really? I guess it runs in the blood. Wow, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. And uh, Small you also, world. Yes, <laughs> and uh, when we were talking about relics, you had a story as well. That's why we brought you on early, because you, you, you had just a wealth of knowledge here, Mr. <laughs> Nathan Mayer. Uh, you had just come back from Montreal or yes. Quebec or someplace? Uh, earlier this month, yeah, um, I went we to- Before we put the wall up, evidently, right? <laughs> I went to uh, Quebec, Canada, and I went, visited St. Joseph Auditory in Montreal, where St. Brother Andre is entombed, and elsewhere in this huge building, where the floor that tells his life story, they display his heart. It's like pickled in a jar. Oh. That's so cool, huh? <laughs> Would wow. you like to have a pickled heart sitting pickled on your Pickled heart. Thing? Yeah. I know people like, you know, pickled eggs, but I don't know. No, I mean, pickled the, heart. I mean, you wouldn't have something like that in your house? No, thank you. Really? She's not the witch from Ben Hobbs and Bruce. No, I mean, people, on, I mean, Steve, Steve Parson, who's coming over for Spirit Quest, uh, and going to be doing several talks, including a closing exorcism on the, uh, at the, the event, and also talking about Battlefield Angels. So, uh, but he collects odd things, as I do, and I have quite a few, you know, yes, odd. Yes, do pieces in Definitely. my collection as well. well. But you know, in relics, we talked about, you talked about the heart, but we had, there were other parts of saints that they were uh, preserved we, We're not going there. We're not going there. We're not going, we're not going there. We're not going to go there. And if we're not going into the parts. Parts we're is not parts, going to go we're to not doing that. But I have, I have, I also have <laughs> uh, the blood of Saint Chabelle, which is a first class relic. Mm -hmm. And um, when I worked with Brian the Monk, who's a Franciscan friar, actually, they call him Brian and the Monk, Bob Cahill did that. Mm -hmm. So um, he, uh, he also did healing and exorcisms. I've gone on a couple of exorcisms with him, but what he did is the, the blood is actually like little grains of sand. Really? Yeah, because it's, you know, there's no liquid in it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's little grains of sand. And he would take it and place it in holy water, and they would use that for healing. Ah, so, uh, cool. and, and when we wrote the book, um, Ghost Chronicles, Maureen and myself, and in the book, it mentions several times that we bless things with holy water. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
we actually, you know, people say, oh, that's crazy. Holy water is just water. You know, what if you're, you know, Muslim and it doesn't work or anything? So anyways, we had Keith Johnson, who you know very well, right? No. Yeah, he, he's the leader <laughs> of my paranormal group, New England Anomalies Research. Did you hear that, Keith? I'll make sure you hear that. That's right. Uh, so he's a demonologist, right? Yes. And so we had him on the show a while back. Way back, show number believe 10. It. Can you believe that? This I, can't, is, I thought it was no, just recently. No. But show anyways, number 10. This is show number 32. So he's talked a little bit about holy water. Yes. Let's roll that. Our holy water. You have, talk yes. about the holy water first. The holy water, of course, that has been blessed. That has been consecrated. Mm -hmm. Just like the Holy Eucharist is, is consecrated. It's a piece of wafer before it's consecrated. Mm -hmm. uh, this is water that has been blessed. It, uh, it looks like regular tap water. Uh, but it does have holy vibrations on it. Um, touching it, I would not be able to tell because I am not a sensitive. Mm -hmm. I would not be able to tell if it's blessed or not, but there are certain people and spirits that will know right away if it's been blessed or not. Right. If you remember the scene in The Exorcist, the famous oh, yeah. movie, <laughs> the, the Exorcist, where um, the uh, possessed individual knew that it was, uh, could tell whether it was blessed or not. And of course, in the course of the story, actually pretended that it was burning her. But um, yeah, so uh, this does have the sacred vibrations on it, and we do use it for an altruistic purpose. We would go into houses and bless windows and doors and spray this around. Okay, so that's a little bit of holy water. In fact, um, I have my own, which is... Shameless plug. Van Helsing Special <laughs> Blend. If you read the book Ghost Chronicles, then you'll know a lot about my special blend, and, and you also know that it works very well. Uh, the bottle comes with a blessed silver cross, also has the St. Michael's Prayer card on it, mm -hmm. on the side of it. Archangel Michael. That's right. It does contain uh, holy water, and it also contains liquid sage and Jack Daniels. So um, <laughs> it's it's a excellent source of protection so thank you very much you're very welcome i spray it around my office occasionally but russ keeps russ coming keeps in, coming in huh? <laughs> you don't wear oh, it oh i love you russ i'm just kidding i'm just kidding you don't wear his perfume <laughs> why not i could tell you stories about that thing but anyway all right all right, all right. so and keith keith uh, was also on the show he talked a little bit about demons because spirit quest is about angels and demons and keith is going to be speaking at Spirit Quest. I don't Funny know you if mentioned you mentioned that. that. He will actually be doing a, a, um, a presentation or a workshop on Demonology 101. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. I'm going to sign up for that one. Yeah, you need it. <laughs> uh, but I need to get somebody out. No. Yeah. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> anyway. So we have another. Are we going to play that? Yeah, clip? let's play that clip. We're going to play the. Uh, sorry. Lost Look, my place. Number six. Number six, uh, Keith discusses holy vibrations versus negative spirit. A cross. It's a simple cross that uh, this is made out of palms, you know, for, mm -hmm. the, for Palm Sunday. Yep. And the palms are blessed. The palms are blessed. Yep. And, and of course, when they are burned, the ashes are used for Ash Wednesday. And uh, so this actually carries are holy vibration. No, no, I'm but not you know Catholic, this stuff, but right? I, I do yeah. know this, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So this. I'll let you know if you're, you're wrong. <laughs> okay, you, let, you correct me if <laughs> but I, you're I, right I on a button, overstep my bounds there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, yeah, they do have uh, holy vibrations on them. Uh -huh. They are sanctified and blessed. And so that carries that holy vibration or that purity with it. And um, that's one way you can use a certain amount of provocation. Now, I, I'm very hesitant about provocation, but provocation is very easy to do when you're in a spiritual atmosphere. But uh, if it is a negative or, or parasitic unholy spirit, whatever you want to call it, uh, they will be aware that an object like this has a holy or sacred vibration on it, that it's been blessed by a holy person and uh, for a positive uh, positive means, altruistic. Mm -hmm. So a spirit will tend to shy away from these. Uh, but if it's cornered, like, like any sort of creature, it will uh, tend to fight back. So if it's cornered, it's going to react. And that's where you get uh, holy vibrations and uh, sacred objects can affect certain negative spirits and get them to reveal their presence. Well, so there you go.
Yeah. So, Nate, you're on Keith's team, right? Yes. Have you ever witnessed them in action Witness. as far as fighting demons? No, I haven't witnessed any heavy-duty action with negative spirits. Mm -hmm. But once I was on an investigation and he was blessing the house and he asked for a sign of departure, mm -hmm. and I swear I heard some kind of sigh over, I think, my, one of my shoulders. And I looked towards that direction and no one was standing there, but I was the only one who heard, heard it. Mm -hmm. And we're not like TV type group. So the clients were there and one of the homeowners looked at me, look in the direction that I heard the noise from. So mm. that's my only wow. story about. Well, that's a personal experience for you. Yeah. And, you know, the Catholic Church is really big with de demonology and so forth, mm -hmm. but other religions as, as well. In fact, uh, I think you have a story about Martin Luther King? Not the king. Not the king. The king has left the building. No. <laughs> um, Martin Luther was a German monk and theologian widely identified with the Protestant Reformation. And when he was at... He tacked that damn thing on the door. <laughs> <laughs> when he was at... Warburg Castle, uh, under the name of Knight George, Luther translated the New Testament from ancient Greek into German in just 10 weeks. This uh, translation of the Bible was not the first into German, but it became the most well-known and widely circulated. And while he was doing this, um, during the beginning of the translation into German, the devil saw this and was furious and wanted to disturb the sacred work. His demons gave, uh, gave him no rest day or night. At last, Luther grabbed his inkwell and threw it at the evil, evil one's head. Still today, um, they show the room and the chair where Luther was sitting, and the mark is still seen on the wall. God's word translated into German gave the devil a fatal wo wound. Then Luther, looking out of the window over the forest, the cloud of smoke from the mines puffed up away and that symbolized all the doubts Luther had in doing his work. Later in life, Luther said, whenever he felt the presence of the devil, he would break wind in his face. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning there is no equal matching to the power of God to the devil, who is always in control, God who's always in control. Faith always wins out and the devil can't stand a word of Christ and his power fails. Wow. That's pretty cool. And that's from way back, way back, you know? When they had inkwells. When they had inkwells. Maybe yeah. there was some holy water in that ink. A Van Helsing special blend. Sprayed it. They might have used that back then. It was back in 1521. Yeah, 15, they might have used it. I, was, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Ron remembers it well. Yeah, it was pretty he good. But well. uh, yeah, that's, I mean, all this stuff, you have so many talks and, and I mean, so many stories about the devil. I mean, there's a lot of stories. Uh, last year, uh, Steve Parsons came over from the UK, as he is this year for Spirit Quest. Yes. And one of the talks he gave was the devil who played cards. And it's all about the, how the devil comes into a uh, tavern or anything and plays cards with him, and then he's finally found out and, and he just goes away. But uh, yeah, he shows up in a lot. I mean, Daniel Webster and the devil, that's a famous story. Mm -hmm. You guys all know that, right? I've I've heard of it. All right, good. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> you I don't want to tell it. Like, that's right. But <laughs> yeah. So I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, stories where the devil shows up, and and, and uh, I remember one house we did investigation, in, and when the family moved in, there were always coins on the windowsills, all face down, and so when they moved in, they collected them all up. Oh. And things began to happen in the house and stuff. So I had never heard of this before, so I, I started doing some research on it. And there is one belief that if you took a coin and you put it face down on the windowsill, right, mm -hmm. when the devil would send his dominions to the house to torment you, they would see the coin with the face looking down and look down to see what they're looking at and get confused and then leave the place alone. <laughs> 
Oh, well, I've never heard of that. Maybe they believe that picking up a coin head down is bad luck. Probably, ah, yeah. That's a different story. I saw a movie the other day, Demons and Gargoyles. You ever see that one? I, Frankenstein? No? no. Oh, no. That was cool. I haven't seen that It was that a bad one. movie. It was a sci-fi movie. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but basically Frankenstein lived, right? Mm -hmm. So he lived, like, immortally, kind of. And uh, there were this corporation of demons. They were all demons. And they were had hired this woman to learn to reanimate, which means make a body come alive again. Mm -hmm. And they wanted I, Frankenstein, or, or the Frankenstein, because uh, he had his diary of, of his father, you know, the creator. Right. So the reason behind this. Frankenstein. Yes, Frankenstein. God bless Gene Wilder, just had to throw that out there. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. And the, all during history, the battle was between demons and the gargoyles. The gargoyles, like yeah. you have there, oh, yeah. fought for, for, everybody thinks they're ugly oh, and everything and, and terrifying, but they <laughs> actually fought for good. And so the, the very end of the, the idea of the whole thing was th that the corporation had been collecting corpses over the years, oh. thousands and thousands of corpses. Sounds great. And if they could reanimate them, right, a corpse has no soul. So they could become possessed by the demons yeah. from hell, and then they could have the final battle. I don't know why okay. I brought that up. That was kind I of a stupid no movie. Idea. Yeah. No idea. But speaking idea. of movies, have you, <laughs> Nathan, have you seen uh, Angels and Demons? I recently watched it, yes. Like today? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this afternoon. Did you like it? Seriously. I enjoyed it. Yeah? It's an enjoyable movie. It, it's worth a whirl. Oh, what, do you, what do you think of the theory behind it, where the Luminari and all that? Um, do you believe in it, the Illuminati? I haven't looked much into them, Yeah. so I, I don't know. Do you know where uh, the Illuminati comes from? I think that we should definitely tell people because yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that don't know. Well, it's, it's a you know it's it's one of these. That's the cool thing about this religion is so many mysteries and and twists and turns. Mm -hmm. Luminari is supposed to be scientists. Okay, the church church persecuted them uh, because they would you know they would say like the sun was not the center of the universe and not God and blah 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 and all these other things. And so they were persecuted. And uh, in fact, Galileo and um, who's that one? Leonardo da Vinci is supposed to be a member of this. So they went underground. And uh, that's what uh, that's all about. They were secret society. Uh, they were forced underground by the church. Uh, they believed in science, not religion. But they didn't realize that there was actually a relationship between science and religion. In fact, the Catholic Church today embraces a lot of theories that were thought as heretic, like uh, evolution, evolution. All right. And uh, mm -hmm. life on other planets is, is no longer Im impossible to the Catholic Church, so. Well, I mean, making great strides. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you, you get, I mean, everybody's, oh, well, it's about time. But that's the good thing, is they just don't jump to conclusions. So at least they are making changes, and, and I understand uh, there are other aspects of of life and reality, so, but it does take time, and, and that's the one interesting thing out. But anyways, Angels and Demons, this weekend, not this weekend, September, when is it? 20... First through the 23rd. Sounds good. <laughs> 20, 23rd through the 25th? <laughs> yes, September. Uh, it'll be up in Groveland, Massachusetts, uh, as, as it starts off with uh, Dining with the Dead, the Conclave. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's dress up, so you can dress up and, and best costume will win. Uh, and we actually elect that via uh, the conclave, the actual ceremony they use to elect the popes, and you get your first clue to find a lost relic. So that starts off, then all day long is Saturday, lectures, workshops, uh, Shroud Turin, uh, readers, uh, vendors, be a lot of fun. And then uh, Saturday night is the Da Vinci Code uh, ghost hunt. Awesome. So it, it would base, base it on the uh, uh, Da Vinci Code book, loosely. <laughs> 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 and it ends up in the chapel, which is a real chapel that we are activating. We're, we're putting an altar together and with religious oh, wow. items and everything. And we're going to have a red light seance to contact the nuns who occupied Vesey Estate. 
and the chapel originally. So it's going to be exciting. Cool. So that's all that. So uh, Nathan, you have anything else to add to, with us? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> no. <laughs> Any that, other no. De demonology uh, incidents? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, nothing on Keith. No, nothing on right, Keith. So He's a good guy. We did have an interesting uh, discussion. We, we don't have time today um, on the show that Keith was on. And he discussed the Perrin investigation, which was the basis for the movie The Conjuring. Right. The Conjuring. Right. And he told us about how he and his brother Carl, and at the time they were teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, went to the house where the family was having all these issues. And so they were kind of first on the scene. Right and described basically the family being terrorized by what they perceived as a demon. And although they could do a temporary fix on getting the demon out, it wasn't a permanent fix. And then later kind of handed it off to Ed and Lorraine Warren, mm -hmm. also uh, known demonologists. and paranormal investigators as well. So the demonology aspect I think is really interesting and I think it takes a very special person to deal with something like scary. that. And, that's, yeah. and yeah. that's one thing that group did right. If your team is just out to set to get evidence and you feel like you're in over your head because it's a mm -hmm. docker entity that mm -hmm. you can't handle, it's best to turn over to a group that knows how to do it right. and not get over your head because the devil will get you. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, I, I know. Joking I'll, aside. Yeah. <laughs> the, a lot of groups that have run into that problem, in mediums too, even mm -hmm. mediums are, have run into that problem. In my investigating, uh, you know, I, I've gone on a couple of uh, exorcisms with the Catholic Church, so I've had that experience in itself. and. Um, I've also run into what I believe are, are demons on, on various investigations. In fact, I, I think I've run into the same one on a couple of places. Mm. So, uh, you know, That's not call good. it negativity, call, I call it a demon, but it, it, was, uh, it was pretty nasty. And, uh, yep. <laughs> yep. Even the Van Helsing special blend? Oh, that works. That was okay. Absolutely. That helped. That helped Absolutely. With our definitely helps. I mean, that's one of the things that issues. protects us while we do our, mm -hmm. our stuff. It's just that. But there are some times, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of these shows and you think, oh, you go in and, and you, you know, throw some sage around or you do a blessing and, and, you know, that's like, all right, it's gone. Yeah. Well, that's not true. I mean, you look at any of the the serious exorcism conducted by the Catholic Church is, is probably the authority on exorcism. They've been doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Is that some of these battles are battles? They take long periods of time uh, to get a final victory, if you want to call it that. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's extremely difficult. I mean, I have, and you had a hierarchy of angels. Yep. There is a hierarchy of demons as well. Oh, I'm sure. And, uh, yep, I remember I, McKee telling us that. I on, did on, see on that in show, my research. The show. But we are getting these. I have a book. You. I have an old, old book, <laughs> a hardcover book that has all the names of the devils and awesome. demons. And Bring so, that with you. you know, it's a spirit quest. Or I'll uh, read them all on the show tonight. <laughs> Well, thank you for listening, everybody. Nathan, thank you for joining and thank us. Thank you, Nathan, okay. for coming and, and chatting with us. And we hope that we'll see a lot of you at Spirit Quest. Sure. If not, you will see us a month from now with Steve Parsons. Really? Yeah, sorry. Uh. So thank you for listening, everybody. Good night and take care.
From goalies to ghosties, long-leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night. Deliver us, good Lord.